In this lecture, we'll be talking about infrastructure. Infrastructure provides much of the underpinnings of a given society. And I'd like to try to divide infrastructure into two main categories, one being conventional infrastructures, and the second category being alternative infrastructures. And we'll be talking about both of those over the course of the, the next few minutes. In industrial civilization, most of the population is heavily reliant on a number of different conventional infrastructures. However, conventional infrastructures rely on abundant energy, primarily in the form of fossil fuels, and there are some large-scale interdependencies among the different infrastructures that we rely on. And I want to talk about a bunch of specific examples um, and also potentially the interdependencies among them. So before we begin, though, I wanted to, um, to frame this as the industrial infrastructures in which we live allow for some amazing things. So the notion that we have a healthcare system that allows for vaccination and all of the different treatments that we have at our disposal are very powerful at preventing and treating disease. The food system that we have allows us to have grapes out of season around the world that have shipped in from other countries. Air travel is an excellent example where ultimately you can be 35,000 feet in the air in a metal container rocketing at 500 miles an hour, which seems dramatic to a, uh, at least a, the primate part of my brain. Um, and as a final example, um, I currently I'm, I'm not wearing my glasses and that's because uh, a couple of weeks ago I had a doctor carve a piece of my eye off, scrape it, you know, sort of zap it with a laser, squeegee it back on, and now I can see I had LASIK. And that's something that hunter-gatherers didn't really have at their disposal. So our industrial infrastructures allow for some really amazing stuff. The Department of Homeland Security lists a selection of what they call critical infrastructure sectors. They define critical infrastructure as the assets, systems, and networks, whether physical or virtual, so vital to the United States that their incapacitation or destruction would have a debilitating effect on security, national economic security, public health or safety, or any combination thereof. And they offer 16 different categories. They offer chemical, commercial, communications, critical manufacturing, dams, defense, emergency services, energy, financial, food, government, healthcare, information technology, nuclear, transportation, and water. So these are the 16 sectors that the Department of Homeland Security thinks are critical. In 2012, they actually had a list of 18. They included monuments and postal. Um, monuments was one in previous offerings of this class where we'd often talk about why monuments was even on the list. Um, I suppose monuments are, are representative of, of civic pride in a certain way, um, but I wasn't altogether sad to see them get dropped off a list of critical infrastructures. Um, postal presumably got rolled into communications. Um, but even with this list, it's interesting to think why, why these 16? Um, why are dams their own category rather than being with water? Why aren't borders one of these examples? What, do they fit into defense or where do, they, where do they fit? How did the Department of Homeland Security come up with these 16 specific instances? Um, it's not immediately clear. Nevertheless, taken together, they represent a pretty significant set of infrastructures. Um, I wanted to point out a variety of potential um, sustainability shortcomings, though, in these different infrastructures. So in the topic of banking and finance, the investing, looking at um, putting money in the bank for the purpose of getting interest, is ultimately only as sustainable as the, an activity as the average of all the society that you're part of. Because when you put your money in a bank, what happens is the bank goes and it loans it out to somebody else. You can't know exactly who they're loaning it out to, but ultimately they're loaning it out to businesses and people buying houses and people building various different companies. And therefore, when you put money in a bank, you're effectively saying, I am investing in the industrial civilization of which I'm a part. Right now, that industrial civilization is very much a growth-based civilization. Therefore, when you put money in the bank, you are becoming part of, you're allowing your money to be part of this broader system. This causes me to think about a couple of different ways you could characterize growth because industrial civilization is often based on growth. That is, it's an explicit policy goal for lots of different, uh, most industrial countries. 
But thinking about growth, I would like to distinguish two different kinds of growth. There's growth as in character growth, where you become better as a person. And then there's growth as in tumor growth, where you have something that is growing at an uncontrollable rate and that is ultimately doing damage. And I fear right now that the growth of industrial civilizations is more like, tu uh, more like tumor growth. And what we need is something more like character growth. And that's a distinction that you might think about as we discuss the topics of this class. In terms of commercial facilities, the manufacturing of concrete, which I found surprising, is actually a very large contributor to climate change. It's apparently the second largest CO2 emitting industry behind power generation. So all the buildings that we work out of and that, that surround us in industrial civilization, um, most of them are built with significant amounts of concrete. And the creating of that concrete uh, is a major contributor to climate change. In terms of dams, uh, dams are heavily implicated in disrupting ecosystems, in transforming habitats of, of different species and causing some species to become endangered or even extinct. Um, so dams have, have some environmental problems. In terms of healthcare and public health, sustainability and health are very closely interlinked. Um, while the industrial healthcare system has all sorts of environmental issues associated with it, the, um, the industrial infrastructure for health is very closely linked to a lot of sustainability issues. So for example, if there's pollution, that both creates environmental problems and also leads to certain kinds of cancer. And this suggests that healthcare and, and sustainability are actually pretty well aligned. In terms of nuclear, uh, nuclear as one of the infrastructures, nuclear is potentially uh, valuable in that it reduces the need for fossil fuels, but it also has some pretty clear environmental implications in terms both of, um, both of urgent problems like what happened at Chernobyl or Fukushima in the wake of the tsunami, or um, even in terms of long term that there's a lot of nuclear waste that won't go away for a very long time and that human civilizations will be saddled with for, uh, for centuries to come. In terms of transportation systems, transportation systems clearly use a great deal of fuel, in particular cars. And there have been some ways that different companies have tried to come up with to save fuel in the way they do the work. So UPS, the United Parcel Service um, that delivers packages, came up with a set of algorithms that allow them to more effectively deliver their packages. What they did essentially is they factored out left turns. They found that their drivers were spending a long time waiting at left turns. And so instead what they did is they plotted out the path. They used computer algorithms to find the optimal path so that all that their drivers had to do was to make a bunch of right turns. And that allowed them to be much more effective at delivering packages economically. Another issue with transportation systems has to do with how they disrupt ecosystems as well. So um, if you put a big, huge highway across a section of forest, the animals on one side of the forest, or the animals and plants on one side of the forest, may not be able to breed with uh, the animals or plants on the other side of the, the freeway. And so this then disrupts and potentially can create different species on, on different sides of the highway um, if enough time passes. Um, and for, for only for certain kinds of animals. And so there is work afoot to try to create biodiversity corridors. These are effectively underpasses for animals. They go under freeways um, and allow for organisms to move from one side to another. And this can hopefully reduce some of the effects of freeways crossing across uh, various different habitats.